It is a great honor to be invited to contribute to this distinguished lecture series. I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the Lee and Wan Foundation for its innovative vision and for its generous support. I would also like to thank the eminent scholar, Professor Lee Juhon, for his efforts in organizing this auspicious occasion. The topic of our lectures this afternoon is the discovery of Buddhism. Before beginning our narrative, it might be useful to say something about the word discovery. In English, the word discovery has the sense of finding something that has not previously been found. It is not invention, creating something that did not exist before, but rather seeing something that exists in the present, something that is already there, but has not been noticed before. But what does it mean to discover something that has been in existence for thousands of years? We do not say that the Chinese or the Koreans discovered Buddhism because Buddhism came to them in the form of monks carrying scriptures and statues. The word discovery in the 19th century language of empire connotes an intrepid traveler setting out for exotic locales. In 1956, archaeologists excavating a 9th century Viking house in Helger Island in Sweden unearthed an Indian statue of the Buddha. The statue dates from the 6th century. Does that mean that the Vikings discovered Buddhism. Alexander the Great led his army across the Indus River in 326 BCE, before the time of Ashoka. Did Alexander discover Buddhism? Thus, it's probably not accurate to say that anyone discovered Buddhism, unless it was the Buddha himself. In a famous metaphor, the Buddha describes a traveler finding an ancient city at the end of an ancient path through a great forest. It was once a great city, but it is now deserted and in ruins. The traveler informs the king who restores the city to its former glory. In this metaphor, the Buddha is that traveler discovering the same path to enlightenment that the Buddhas of the past had found. Thus, in Buddhism, the Dharma is something that is found and then lost and then found again. That is why it is said that the next Buddha does not appear in the world until the teachings of the previous Buddha have been entirely forgotten. As long as the path to the city of enlightenment remains passable, and the city itself remains prosperous, there is no reason for repair. But when the city falls into ruin and the path is overgrown with oblivion, then the path must be cleared again and the city restored. This is what the Buddha and the Buddhas do again and again over the aeons. The first reference to the Buddha in a Christian source appears in the works of Saint Clement of Alexandria, who died in 215 of the Common Era. In describing the gymnosophists of India, he writes, quote, some of the Indians obey the precepts of Bauta, whom, on the account of his extraordinary sanctity, they have raised to divine honors. Later in the text, Apparently describing a stupa, Clement says that the gymnosophists, quote, honor a kind of pyramid under which they believe the bones of some gods are resting, end quote. The problem is that the word gymnosophist means naked philosopher. And unlike other Indian ascetics of the time, Buddhist monks did not go naked. Thus, one of the questions to keep in mind this afternoon is, even if we have set aside the word discovery, what does it mean to encounter Buddhism when one does not know what it is that one is encountering? 
This will be one of the themes of our lectures today. In my comments this afternoon, I will be turning to the past, but not to the ancient India and the time of the Buddha 2,500 years ago. Instead, I will, I, will, I will be returning to a more distant, to a more recent past to help us answer the question, how did the West come to love the Buddha? And as we shall see, for many centuries, the Buddha was not loved. In deciding how to present this, the vast topic of the discovery of Buddhism, Professor Four and I have decided to adopt a chronological approach. I will begin with the first reference to the Buddha that appears in a European source and will continue up to the year 1844. Professor Four will take us up to the present day. I will begin with 1844 and go backward in time. In that year, Eugène Brunouf, the father of the modern study of Buddhism in the West, described the state of European knowledge at the beginning of the 19th century. He writes, quote, for some, Buddhism was a venerable cult born in Central Asia and whose origin was lost in the midst of time. For others, it was a miserable counterfeit of Nestorianism. Buddha has been made a Negro because he had frizzy hair, a Mongol because he had slanted eyes, a Scythe from Scythia because he was called Shakya. He has even been made a planet. And I do not know whether some scholars do not still delight today in recognizing this peaceful sage in the traits of the bellicose Norse god Odin." End quote. These sentences seem puzzling to us. No one thinks these things today, and we are unaware that anyone ever did, and cannot imagine why anyone ever would. But the Buddha, as he is known in the West today, is a, is a rather recent vintage. For more than a thousand years, Europeans had all manner of strange ideas about the Buddha. These strange ideas, held by many of the greatest scholars of their time, have been forgotten because they were wrong. Still, there might be some value in remembering their errors. However, there are far too many of those errors to cover in a single lecture. Therefore, I will center my comments today around three vignettes, one from China, one from Thailand, and one from medieval Europe. As we shall see, each is a case of mistaken identity. The first of these vignettes involves two very famous Italians, Marco Polo and Matteo Ricci. After his years of service to the great Khan, Marco Polo sailed home to Venice. His ship made port in Sri Lanka, probably in 1292. In his account of the island, Marco Polo describes the mountain that is known as Adam's Peak. And I quote, furthermore, you must know that in the island of Ceylon, there is an exceedingly high mountain it rises right up so steep and precipitous that no one could ascend it were it not that they have taken and fixed to it several great and massive iron chains, so disposed that by the help of these, men are able to mount to the top. And I tell you, they say that on this mountain is the sepulcher of Adam, our first parent. At least, that is what the Saracens say. But the idolaters say that it is the, it is the sepulcher of Sagamoni Borkhan, before whose time there were no idols. They hold him to have been the best of men, a great saint in fact, according to their fashion, and the first in whose name idols were made." End quote. It is unclear whether Marco Polo made the perilous trip to the summit of the mountain because at the summit, there is not a tomb, but a large set of footprints. 
the Muslims believe that the Garden of Eden was in heaven and, then, and that when Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, they set foot on earth for the first time, descending to the summit of what they would call Adam's Peak on the island of Sri Lanka. Thus, Marco's, Marco Polo's reference to the Muslims, and he calls them Saracens. It's also noteworthy that Marco Polo called the Buddha Sagamoni Borkhan, which is Shakyamuni Buddha in Mongolian, a name he surely learned at the court of Kublai Khan. He calls Buddhists idolaters, as Europeans would call Buddhists for centuries. Still, it seems strange that Marco Polo would describe the Buddha as, quote, the first in whose name idols were made. He must have learned this at the Yuan court. According to a well-known Chinese legend, the Emperor Ming of the Han Dynasty, who reigned from 58 to 75 of the Common Era, had a dream in which he saw a golden being flying in front of his palace, emitting rays of light from the top of his head. The next day, the emperor asked his ministers who this spirit might be. One of them replied that he had heard that there was a sage in the West called Buddha who, who had attained the Tao and was able to fly. The emperor then dispatched a delegation in search of this sage. Arriving finally in the Tarim Basin in Central Asia, they acquired a copy of a work called the Sutra in 42 Sections, which they presented to the emperor. This is how Buddhism arrived in China according to this famous legend. The Italian Jesuit Matteo Ricci arrived in Macau in 1582. 20 years later, Ricci had learned Chinese well, well enough to write an exposition of Christianity in Chinese called the Chen Chu Shi, or the True Doctrine of the Lord of Heaven. There, he argued that the very presence of Buddhism in China was a case of mistaken identity. He recounted the famous story of the dream of the Emperor Ming and the delegation sent to the West to retrieve the teachings of the Golden Man. Describing Jesus, Ricci writes, quote, when his work of preaching was complete, he ascended to heaven in broad daylight at a time forecast by himself. Four saints recorded the deeds he had performed while on earth, as well as his teachings. These were transmitted to many countries, and large numbers of people from all quarters believed in him, keeping his commandments from one generation to another. From this time onwards, many nations in the West took great strides along the road to civilization. He continues. When we examine Chinese history, we find that Emperor Ming of the Han Dynasty heard of these events and sent ambassadors on a mission to the West to search for canonical writings. Midway, these ambassadors mistakenly took India to be their goal and returned to China with Buddhist scriptures, which were then circulated throughout the nation. From then until now, the people of your esteemed country have been deceived and misled. That they have not heard the correct way is truly a great tragedy for the field of learning. Was it not a disaster?" End quote. Thus, for Matteo Ricci, the arrival of Buddhism had been a terrible mistake. The emperor's dream, in fact, foretold the coming of Christ to China not the coming of the Buddha. The delegation only made half the journey. Arriving in India, they decided not to continue to Jerusalem. Instead, they took some Indian books and went back home. The Christian missionaries were therefore carrying out the emperor's instructions as his own envoys had not, by finally bringing the teachings of the true golden man from the West to China. Ricci describes the Buddha as a small man, arrogant and boastful, who thought that he was as worthy of worship as God and taught such benighted 
doctrines as reincarnation and the prohibition against killing animals. If God did not want us to kill animals for food, Ricci argues, why did he make their flesh taste so good? The next vignette is from Thailand. In the stories of the Buddha's life, there are two villains, one divine and one human. The divine villain is Mata, the deity of death and desire. It is Mata who attacks the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, trying to prevent his achievement of Buddhahood. The human villain is Devadatta, the Buddha's cousin. Devadatta became a monk when the Buddha returned to his home city after his enlightenment and seemed to have been a dedicated monk for decades. It was only when the Buddha grew old that the trouble began. Eight years before the Buddha's passage into Nirvana, Devadatta went to the Buddha and suggested that, in light of the Buddha's advanced age, he was at this point 72 years old, leadership of the order of monks should be turned over to him. In front of the entire assembly of monks, Devadatta rose, threw his upper robe over his shoulder, approached the Buddha, and with his palm joined, said, Lord, the Blessed One is now old, burdened with years, advanced in life, and come to the last stage. Let the Blessed One now rest. Let him dwell in, the, in bliss in the present life. Let him hand over the order of monks to me. I will govern the order of monks. The Buddha refused. However, the Buddha often refused the first request, only to agree the third time. When Devadatta asked the third time, the Buddha again refused, adding in one of the less compassionate statements in the Buddhist canon, quote, why would I turn over the order to a clot of spittle like you? Smarting from this public humiliation, Devadatta sought revenge and pl plotted to assassinate the Buddha. He first hired 16 archers to kill him, but the Buddha ended up converting each of them. Next, Devadatta decided to kill the Buddha himself, pushing a large boulder down Vulture Peak as the Buddha was walking back and forth in its shade. Two large outcroppings miraculously arose out of the mountain to block its path, but a splinter of rock broke off and struck the Buddha's toe, causing it to bleed enough that the physician Jivaka had to be called to bind the wound. Devadatta tried a third time to murder the Buddha, this time sending the great elephant Nalagiri, made drunk on palm wine, to trample him, but when he reached the Buddha, the elephant knelt down and the Buddha stroked his head. Unable to assassinate the Buddha, Devadatta determined to win the allegiance of the order of monks. He recommended that all monks should follow five rules. First, they should live their entire lives in the forest and not live in villages. Second, they should live entirely on the alms they receive from begging and should not accept invitations to dine in the homes of the laity. Third, they should only wear robes made from discarded rags and should not accept offerings of cloth from the laity. Fourth, they should dwell at the foot of a tree and not under a roof. And fifth, they should not eat fish or meat. Hearing of this, the Buddha declared that any monk who wished to obey these rules was free to do so, but he would not declare these practices to be obligatory. Devadatta then denounced the Buddha for being lax in the practice of asceticism, apparently gaining a substantial following of new monks who departed with Devadatta. But they were quickly pers persuaded to return. Devadatta vomited blood at the news of their desertion. Knowing that his own end was near, he set off to see the Buddha one last time. According to some accounts, he was sincerely contrite. According to others, he smeared poison on his fingernails for one last assassination attempt. But as he rested at the shore of a pond where he'd stopped to bathe, he was slowly swallowed by the earth, first his feet, then his knees, 
then his chest, then his neck, and finally his head. He disappeared, descending into Avicii, where he suffered a horrible fate. Avicii, of course, is the most horrific of the Buddhist hells. There, it is said, Devadatta's body grew to be 100 kilometers in height, such that his head touched the top of the vast chamber of Avicii, and his feet sank up to his ankles into the hell's surface of solid iron. His head was placed inside an iron helmet that held him motionless. Then, as the commentary to the Dhammapada explains, quote, an iron stake as thick as the trunk of a palmyra tree proceeded forth from the west wall of, of the iron shell, pierced the small of his back, came forth from his breast, and penetrated the east wall. Another iron stake proceeded from the south wall, pierced his right side, came forth from his left side, and penetrated the north wall. Another iron stake proceeded forth from the top of the iron helmet, pierced his skull, came forth from his lower parts, and penetrated the earth of iron. In this position, immovable, he suffers this mode of torture." End quote. In the year 1687, King Louis XIV sent an embassy to Thailand, led by Simon de la Lubert. Upon his return to Paris, he published an account of his travels, quickly translated into English in 1693 as a new historical relation of the Kingdom of Siam. Here, we are surprised to find a lengthy biography, not of the Buddha, but of Devadatta, apparently commissioned by the ambassador himself. The rendition is quite faithful, describing his in infernal fate in some detail. But why was the French legation to the court of Siam so interested in the story of Devadatta? Alexander Chevalier de Chaumont was the first ambassador sent by Louis to Siam. The Chevalier was accompanied by two priests, the Abbe de Choisy and the, and the Jesuit priest Guy Tachard. Father Tachard provides a detailed description of the life of the Buddha in the course of which he writes, quote, though there be many things that keep the Siamese at a distance from the Christian law, yet one may say, nothing makes them more averse from it than this thought the similitude that is to be found in some points betwixt their religion and ours, making them believe that Jesus Christ is the very same with Devadatta. They are persuaded that seeing we are the disciples of the one, we are also followers of the other. And the fear that they have of falling into hell with Devadatta if they follow his doctrine. This suffers them not to hearken to the propositions that are made to them of embracing Christianity. That which most confirms them in their prejudice is that we adore the image of our crucified savior, which plainly represents the punishment of Devadatta. So when we would explain to them the articles of our faith, they take us up short, saying that they do not need our instructions and that they know already better than we do what we have a mind to tell them." End quote. And so we can only imagine the scene at the Thai court as the French delegation is, is escorted in the presence of the king. A group of monks stand silently at one side, their eyes widening when they see that each of the foreign priests is wearing around his neck a little statue of Devadatta in hell. Other Jesuits from, from other countries would also excoriate the Buddha. Learning that the Buddha had been born from his mother's right side, and learning that the Buddha's mother had died seven days after his birth, the great Jesuit Athanasius Kircher would claim that the little baby Buddha had murdered his mother by gnawing his way out of her womb and through her ribcage. The final vignette concerns Barlam and Josephat, one of the most popular stories in Europe during the Middle Ages, 
translated from Latin into dozens of European vernaculars. Barlam and Josephat were not simply literary characters, they were regarded as historical figures and as saints, credited with the miraculous and of course mythical conversion of India from pagan idolatry to Christianity. In 1571, the Doge of Venice presented a bone from Josephat's spine to King Sebastian of Portugal. That relic is enshrined today in the Church of St. Salvatore in Antwerp. The story of Barlam and Josephat is famous today, however, because it is based on the life of the Buddha. The evidence of the influence is found in three famous elements of the life of the Buddha as it is traditionally told in Asia. In the Buddha's story, the, after the birth of Prince Siddhartha, the future Buddha, his father the king, summons the court astrologers to foretell his son's destiny. Alarmed that his son will re renounce the world, the king builds a special palace for his son where he will be shielded from all that is pleasant what is that all that is unpleasant and unattractive in order to prevent him from becoming discouraged with life in the world. A very similar scene occurs in Barlam and Josephat where the king, a devotee of idols and a persecutor of Christians, hears the astrologer's predictions and fears that his son will someday become a Christian. He therefore builds a special palace to prevent such a fate. Second, in the life of the Buddha, after living in the palace for 29 years, Prince Siddhartha becomes curious about the world beyond the walls and asks his father to allow him to take an excursion with his charioteer. On four successive occasions, four successive chariot rides, the prince encounters, for the first time in his life, an old man, a sick man, a corpse, and finally a meditating monk. Learning of the realities of aging, sickness, and death, as well as the existence of those who seek to escape them. In Barlam and Josephat, Prince Josephat also rides outside the city, encountering a blind man and a leper the first time, and an old man the second. He does not encounter a corpse or a meditating monk, but shortly after his second excursion, the Christian monk Barlam arrives from the island of Serendip, or Sri Lanka, to provide instruction in the gospel to, to the son of the idolatrous king. Prince Josephat requests and receives baptism from Barlam. In this third shared scene, after returning from his four chariot rides, Prince Siddhartha, married and with a newborn son, requests his father's permission to leave his family and royal destiny to go in search of a state beyond birth and death. His father refuses and instead attempts to distract the prince by having a group of courtesans beguile him with their beauty but the prince remains unmoved. In Barlam and Josephat, the father, King Avenir, instructs a group of beautiful women to seduce the virgin Prince Josephat, and a slave princess almost succeeds. The chastity of the prince is preserved when he has a vision of hell that awaits him should he succumb to this passion. These three scenes are the extent of the literary connection between the life of the Buddha and the story of Barlam and Josephat. Yet these three central elements of the plot of Barlam and Josephat clearly derive from the life of the Buddha. Precisely how they passed from ancient India to medieval Europe is still not completely understood. The many European vernacular versions can be traced back to a Latin version, the earliest of which dates from 1048. Scholars believe that the Greek story, from which the Latin is derived,
was translated from the language of Georgian, Georgia of the former Soviet Union, perhaps by Euthymius the Georgian, who died in 1028, abbot of the monastery on Mount Athos in Greece. The Georgian tale that had he translated and which still exists is called the Balabariana and was likely composed by Georgian monks living in Jerusalem during the 9th or 10th centuries. But how did the story of the Buddha make its way from India to Israel? Two Arabic works survive with the title Kitab Bilawar wa Budasaf, the book of Bilawar and Budasaf, with the earliest dating from sometime between 750 and 900. It is clear from the considerable overlap in the parables found in the two stories that the Georgian version of Barlam and Josephat derives from an Arabic text. The Georgian monks took the basic story there of a royal father who extols the virtues of life in the world and a royal son who extols the virtues of asceticism, a story, by the way, with very little Muslim context, content, and then Christianized it by turning it into the story of an idolatrous king, a persecutor of Christians, and his virtuous son who was converted to Christianity by the pious monk Barlam. The prince then converts his father and then eventually all of India to the Christian faith. References in the Arabic text to the rather mysterious figure of the Buddha, who is called Al-Budd in Arabic, were simply removed in the Christian retelling. It is here with this Arabic text that the trail goes cold. Buddhism was known in Persia during the pre-Islamic time, and scholars speculate that the book of Bilawad and Budasaf derives from a Persian source now lost. Still, the path from language to language marks the path of influence quite clearly. Josephat in Latin is Ioasaf in Greek. Ioasaf in Greek is Iodasaf in Georgian. Iodasaf in Georgian is Budasaf in Arabic. And Budasaf in Arabic is Bodhisattva in Sanskrit. Bodhisattva, as we know, is the primary epithet of Prince Siddhartha prior to the time of his enlightenment and the time he becomes the Buddha. Indeed, we find in 1591, Jesuit missionaries publishing Barlam and Josephat in a Japanese translation in an effort to convert the Buddhists there to Christianity. And so the head-spinning ironies abound Islam, long, condemned, although wrongly, for bringing about the demise of Buddhism in India, becomes the vehicle for the story of the Buddha to travel incognito from Asia to Europe. The story of the Buddha, whom European missionaries would excoriate for centuries as an idol and as a purveyor of idolatry, is transformed by Christian monks into the story of a prince called Prince Josephat, rather than Prince Siddhartha, a prince who converts the pagans of India from idolatry, idolatry to Christianity. The Buddhist prince becomes a Christian saint. Yet, as that saint fell into obscurity, the original Bodhisattva coalesced into the figure of the Buddha and came to be respected as the founder of a great world religion. As we examine the story of the West's encounter with Buddhism, we see that European views of the Buddha pass through three phases. The first and the longest is what we might call the idol phase. For centuries, Europeans divided the world into four nations, Christians, Jews, Mohammedans, and idolaters, also known as pagans and heathens. Buddhists fell into this final, none of the above category of idolaters. And the idol that they worshipped was the Buddha. However, 
Europeans did not know that the idol was the Buddha for a very long time. Each Buddhist country has its own translation of the Buddha's names and epithets. Just in our, in our vignettes, he has been called Chijamone, Somonokodon, and al Bud. Thus, for centuries, Europeans imagined that different Buddhist lands worship different idols. In my research, I've collected some 300 different names for the Buddha in European sources. Here are some of them. Not only did the Buddha have different names, but each Buddhist country had its own art artistic conventions for representing him in sculpture and in painting. We know ourselves that a Korean Buddha image looks very different from a Thai Buddha image. These differences only confirmed Europeans in their belief that they were in fact different idols. Those, differ those differences are represented in the engravings of the time. Some of these engravings may have been based on sketches made at the site. Others are likely based on a written description. I would like to show you some of these engravings, engravings that represent an important and almost entirely neglected area of Buddhist art. So that first we have Somo no Kodon, which is the Thai way of saying Shramana Gautama, a rare naked Buddha from Thailand. Next, also from Thailand, a rather corpulent Buddha. Next, from China, the idol Zekia, being worshipped by monks wearing odd hats. Next, a depiction of a natural formation, a mountain in China, that bears a remarkable resemblance to the idol Fu, Fu, the Chinese word for Buddha. Next, from Japan, the rarely seen bearded Buddha. Next, we see what appears to be a giant two-year-old named Debot. In fact, Debot is Daibutsu, great Buddha in Japanese. Next, from China, the idol Seichia, with inscriptions in fake Chinese. Here we see a rather rare depiction of the Buddha with a third eye. And the little known crotch grabbing mudra. Those of you who have been to Tibet will not recognize Hasa in this slide. It's drawn from the famous book China Illustrata by Athanasius Kircher published in 1677. We see that the engraver had some difficulties representing the Buddha's feet in the lotus posture. The caption, not visible here, describes both figures as the idol many pay, that is, Mani Padme, from Om Mani Padme Hong, in the city of Barantola, in the kingdom of Lhasa. Those of you who have visited Kyoto will likely not recognize this next image, which is Sanju Sangento. And finally, we have this image, uh, apparently from Bodh Gaya.
If the first period of, Europe, of the European encounter with the Buddha was the idol phase, we might call the second the legend phase. The period when Europeans began to collect various stories about the Buddha and also to compare them. One of the key moments in this period occurred in 1690 when a German physician in the employ of the Dutch East India Company named Engelbert Kampfer arrived in Japan. Kampfer's voyage had begun at the company's headquarters in Batavia, modern Jakarta, and before sailing to Japan, his ship had stopped for a time in Thailand. Thus, over the course of a few months, Kampfer was able to see both a Thai Buddha image and a Japanese Buddha image, and he figured out that they were the same person. But this is not the only reason that Kampfer is important to our story. He was also an influential proponent of what might be called the African hypothesis. In his account of his travels, he writes, quote, the Siamites, that is the people of Siam, represent the first teacher of their paganism in their temples in the figure of a Negro sitting of a prodigious size, his hair curled, the skin black, but as it were out of respect, guilt over, accompanied on each side by one of his chief companions, as also before and around him by the rest of his apostles and disciples, all the same color and most in the same posture. Besides this, many circumstances make it possible, probable, that the pra, or siaka, was no Asiatic or Indian, but some Egyptian priest of note, probably of Memphis, and a Moor, who with his brethren being expelled from their native country, brought the Egyptian religion into the Indies and propagated it there. End quote. Later in his narrative, Kampfer specifies the circumstances of the expulsion of the Egyptian priests. He notes that in 525 BCE, the Persian king Cambyses II, son of Cyrus the Great, defeated the Egyptians at the famous Battle of Pelusium. Herodotus reports that the Persians advanced into battle carrying cats, knowing that the Egyptians would not shoot their arrows for fear of harming their sacred animal. Cambyses then led his army to Memphis where he captured the pharaoh and executed hundreds of priests. Camper explained that some of these Egyptian priests escaped by boat to India where they promulgated the worship of Egyptian gods. From there, Egyptian religion, including the doctrine of transmigration, spread to Indochina, then to China, and then to Japan. In the 18th century then, there was a general consensus that the Buddha had been an historical figure, but his place of origin was a matter of speculation and debate. Buddhism had long been dead in India when Vasco da Gama's ship landed in the southwest coast in 1498. There were no Buddhists there, and the great Buddhist architectural monuments were in ruins. Engelbert Kampfer and others speculated that the Buddha had come from Egypt. Others said Sri Lanka, yet others Thailand. Sir William Jones, the father of Sanskrit studies, thought that Buddhism had spread to Asia from Scandinavia and that the Buddha was in fact the Norse god Odin. It was only when the British were firmly established in India that the right answer was discovered. This is the third phase, the phase of the texts. As a result of their victory in a war with the Gurkhas of Nepal, in 1816, the British East India Company demanded the right to have a representative called a resident at the Nepalese court in Kathmandu. Two years later, a young officer of the, of the company arrived in Calcutta. His name was Brian Houghton Hodgson. Hodgson would soon be appointed as assistant resident and later resident at the court of Nepal. The Nepalese court 
had only grudgingly accepted the presence of the British in Kathmandu, and so kept them essentially under house arrest. Hodgson, in his early 20s, and with nothing better to do, began collecting copies of the books of the local Nawars, a Buddhist community in the largely Hindu Nepal. He knew enough Hindustani to recognize that they were in Sanskrit and that they were Buddhist texts, although he could not read them with any real fluency. But he knew they would be of interest to the scholars of Europe, where a Sanskrit craze was sweeping the continent in the wake of Sir William Jones' discovery that Sanskrit was directly related to Greek and Latin. So Hodgson had copies made and sent them to a number of universities and learned societies in Europe. The texts that Hodgson sent to Paris include many of the most important works in the history of Buddhism. But no one paid attention in the other European capitals. It was only they were only read in Paris, and here it's time for me to step away from the podium in favor of Professor Four. But before doing so, I would, I would ask, what became of Zaka and Samono Kodong, of Budu and Fo? They are forgotten, only recalled as so many mistakes of a bygone age. We know better now. Unlike the intrepid travelers and missionaries to foreign climes, when we walk through the Metropolitan Museum in New York, or the Musée Guimet in Paris, or the National Museum of Korea here in Seoul, and see the works of art on display, a wooden statue from the Koryo period, a Tibetan tanka painted from the time of the seventh Dalai Lama, a bronze image from the reign of King Rama IV of Thailand, a stone carving from, Gan from Gandhara, we know that they all represent the same person. Unlike our intrepid travelers, our eyes have been properly trained to see through the bright colors and varnishes of fantastic invention, to see through the most striking differences in form, in color, in style, in accoutrement, to see a single figure just as our minds have been trained to translate Hotoke and Sangye Jomdente and Praputa Jiao and pu into a single word, Buddha. But are they the same? Was something lost in the march of scholarly progress? Did something disappear when weathered stone turned into smooth flesh, when the idol turned into an image? Perhaps the collapse of many gods into a single human Buddha effaced a level of detail, of specificity, of locality that can no longer be discerned, yet was glimpsed long ago by eyes that could still be captivated and astonished, eyes that could not read, eyes that could only see. Thank you. <laughs>